So now what we're going to do is we're going to get into the different hormones that plants can have. Um, so it's kind of interesting because people don't realize that plants have hormones, but they do. Um, so the first one we're going to talk about is going to be auxin, and this is the one you'll hear about the most, and that's just because it's a very common one and it does a lot of different jobs. And so um, one thing that it's going to be really big with is stem and root elongation, so with primary growth of the plant. Um, it's also going to help with determining um, the direction of growth based on gravitational pull. So that's kind of interesting. Um, but you'll see oxen come up here and there like throughout any type of plant, you know, histology type of stuff. Um, next one, cytokinins. Now, if you look at this word, cytokin, that's also cytokinesis, right? And if you remember what cytokinesis means, that means cell splitting. And that's exactly what this one's going to do. So this is going to be anywhere where there's active growth happening, whether it's making a fruit, an embryo developing, um, roots and shoots, that type of thing. Um, the next one is gibberellins, and gibberellins are going to do a whole bunch of different things. They're going to help with elongation of things, but they're also going to help with leaf growth, fruit growing, pollen production, and germination of seeds. Um, now, when we're going through these, I should mention that um, these are things that are naturally produced by the plant to do these processes, but if we wanted the plant to do these things, we could actually add extras of this, and that could help them to grow. And that's technically not like fertilizer, which is like chemicals like nitrogen and phosphorus. These are hormones. Now, some people are like, no, don't do anything. Just let the plant grow. And other people are like, well, this is something that they already produce. So if we give them a little extra, what's the big deal? That's your call. Um, OK, next one, brisinosteroids. So the last part, steroids, usually has to do with um, hormones like sex hormones and things, right? And so they do act similarly to the sex hormones of animals. Um, so this is going to promote like seed germination and you know those types of things to happen. Um, and the last two are going to be ones that are going to be produced in response to drought or tough conditions. So we've got abscisic acid and what this is going to do is if you're in a drought obviously you want to conserve energy and so this is going to make the plant stop growing, close their stomata and promote their seed dormancy. And so that's going to be everything they can do in order to deal with a drought. Now the last one, ethylene, this is also going to be something that a plant will respond to stress with. And this is going to be a little different though because this is going to cause the leaves to drop off and the fruit to ripen. And so we actually use ethylene, or I should say your supermarkets use them all the time. Um, so let's say that they have a whole thing of tomatoes that they want to ship to one of their stores. Well, if they get the tomatoes off the vine and they're red and they're ripe, they're going to get rotten by the time they get to the store, or they may have like a day before they go rotten. So what they do is they actually pick them when they're green, they ship them green, and then when they get to the store or close to the store, they'll actually pump ethylene gas into the area, and that will make them ripen and turn red, even though they're probably not ready to be red, and that's what ethylene does. Um, so if you ever have like an avocado or a banana or something like that that you want to ripen, something that gives off a ton of ethylene gas is going to be an apple. So you can just stick one of those in a brown paper bag with an apple, close it up, and the ethylene gas will get released and those will ripen within a day or two. So um, ethylene is something that you would want to avoid if you were shipping something and you didn't want it to spoil, right? Okay, now these next ones are kind of cool, and these are going to be about how plants can respond to different situations. So one thing that they can do is respond to light. So obviously that's going to have the word photo in the beginning of it, right? Because photo always has to do with light. And so photo, photomorphogenesis is going to be any sort of light trigger development that a plant's going to do. Um, that could just be the start of um, cell division within a seed. It could be root and shoot elongation or anything like that. So going along with that, phototropism is going to be a directional response. So going towards the light, right, because plants obviously like light. And I've got some pretty cool videos here to show you. This is phototropism occurring in this plant. And so what they're going to do is they've got that light, and they're going to put the plant on its side. Um, oh, sorry, that's a different one. <laughs> in this one, um, they've got the light over to the side. And what's going to happen is you'll notice that the plant is going to start curving over to the left because it wants to maximize its exposure to the light. So if you've ever put like a plant on a windowsill and it started to do that weird curve towards the light, that's phototropism happening right there. Um, 
In the next video I'm going to show you, this is called gravitropism. So obviously this is going to be a plant's response to gravity. And this is the one where it's going to have the plant put on its side, and um, even though it has light in one direction, it is responding more heavily to the issue of gravity, and it still knows to actually grow upwards, which is kind of interesting. And so once again, going back to the hormones, that would definitely be due to that auxin that we talked about. So here you can already see it's starting to curve upwards, and that's because it can sense Earth's gravitational um, force, and so it's trying to um, deal with that and still grow upwards. And if you could see the roots, the roots would be growing downwards as well. Now, um, the next one is going to be something called thigmotropism, and thigmotropism has to do with touch, a response to touch. And um, this is super cool. Um, if you think about the Venus flytrap, that's a perfect example of responding to touch. Um, what I'm going to show you here is going to be a plant called a mimosa plant, and this has really, really fast response to touch. And you find this like, uh, this used to grow in Florida in kind of like scrub areas, which is a little bit drier, and um, they think that this is a response to not wanting to dry out in like really windy conditions. And so you'll actually see how this responds to touch in this video. So it's a pretty cool little plant and super fun to play with. I used to play with these in Florida all the time. So it's got a compound leaf, right? So it's going to have that um, pinnately compound leaf. And now they're going to show you what happens if you touch it. So this is real time, and you can see it just shuts right all, all, all right away. Um, they're also going to show you in this next video um, pulling off one of the leaves. And I think what's cool about this is you can actually see the hormone, you know, traveling through the plant. Um, so it's closing its leaves in response to that. And these will stay closed for like, I don't know, two minutes, three minutes, and then they'll open up again. Um, and this next one is kind of neat. You can actually see the hormone travel throughout the entire plant. So once again, um, you can see that the leaves are closing, and that response is traveling through the plant. But now you're going to actually see it travel through the rest of the leaves. And this is all done through water pressure. That's how it actually does that um, closing mechanism. And that's why you see the branch kind of falling down here, because it's going to be losing water pressure, because it's using it to do this response here. But pretty cool. Like I said, super fun. I found them in Costa Rica and was like, wee, like running through the forest, because they're just so fun to play with. OK, some other examples of thigmotropism. This is a plant here called a sundew. And what the sundew does is it actually secretes these um, kind of bubbles that are like like the consistency of honey and very sweet. And what happens is um, a little insect is going to go in there and actually get caught. And you can see the insect right there. And um, it can't get out. And then what's going to happen is this is actually going to curl over it and then eventually give it a um, little dose of digestive enzymes. And that'll kill the insect. And then it can get that to eat, which is lovely. And then, of course, we've seen the Venus flytrap before. Oops. Um, whoa. I think I've already shown you this video, but it's still pretty cool. And that's, once again, thigmotropism. So they've got little sensors within the um, leaf, and then it can actually close. So there you can see it, and there it closes, right? And then this is a little gnarly with the frog, but it still shows you what can happen. Whoa. Um, little graphic there, but anyway, you can see what happens with that. <clears throat> okay. So those are going to all be examples of thigmotropism. Now, like I was saying when you were watching that video, the way that it works is through something called turgor pressure, which is just going to be water pressure. And so the plants will get some sort of a signal that something needs to happen, and they'll push the water into one direction or the other. And at the end of every leaflet, there's going to be a little swollen area called pulvini, and the pulvini are actually going to swell or shrink, and that will make the leaf move in whatever way the plant wants to. Okay. Um, another rhythm that can be a uh, response to all this stuff, too, is going to be circadian rhythms. And we talked about that when we talked about behavior. And so plants have circadian rhythms, too. And so that's usually a 23 to 24 hour clock that they're set to. And this is going to be, if you noticed in some of those videos, the leaves came up and then they went down and then they came up and then they went down. That's going to be um, an example of how they're going to do that in response to sunlight, right? So they're going to lift their leaves to maximize photosynthesis and then they can relax a little bit at night. And that's all going to be related to circadian rhythm. It's pretty cool because farmers with hydroponics have actually figured out a way to um, shorten what a plant thinks is a day by doing light and dark cycles inside. 
And so it, within one day, you can trick a plant into thinking it's been two days, and they can grow faster, and then you can get crops from them faster. So kind of interesting way to manipulate circadian rhythm. Um, and then the last thing here is going to be dormancy. And so we've talked about seeds and how plants can produce seeds that can go dormant for a little bit, which is great. And um, dormancy is going to be something that the plant needs to know to come out of. And so there's a lot of things that will signal it to do that. A lot of water, um, longer daytime hours, different wavelengths of sunlight, but all of those are going to actually get it out of dormancy. And so the opposite types of things may make it go into dormancy. So like not a lot of water, shorter days, colder temperatures, those types of things. So that is it for the plants. Next chapter is going to be about fungus, and then it's animals for the rest of the semester.